Good morning to uh, everybody and thank you for attending. And if you're attending from uh, overseas, uh, good afternoon. So uh, today's topic um, is the lime kill in the paper mill and more specifically the factory in the paper mill. So in, in our uh, presentation today, the agenda includes actually three items. The craft pulping process, which not everybody may be real familiar with. Um, Secondly, the uh, kill refractory, and finally, how the refractory and the lime recovery kill wears. Why should we be interested in paper industry? Well, that industry is a well-defined market. There are over 140 rotary kills in the United States alone in this industry. Refractory contractors serve the individual mills and pretty much control the market. And last and best, Resco has great products for the rotary kill. The rotary kill itself can be looked upon as a big chemical reactor. It is a counterflow process in that the exhaust gas from combustion travels from the lower discharge end to the feed end. And the kill product, of course, moves downhill from the feed end to the discharge. Our discussion will focus today on the calcination reaction, which is the conversion of calcium carbonate using heat, and heat is symbolized by the triangle, into calcium oxide, also called lime, and carbon dioxide. So these are the products of the kill, carbon, di um, carbon dioxide and calcium oxide. This equation is central to every lime plant and every cement plant. Unfortunately, this chemical reaction also has a high penalty and energy cost as the reaction does not proceed until about 1500 degrees Fahrenheit has been reached in the kill. Lime kills are used only in the craft paper process. Craft means strong. Interestingly, the earliest lime kills in the paper industry in the U.S. date to 1930 at Panama City, Florida, and 1934 at West Point, Virginia. Today, there are some 475 rotary kills in use globally for the lime recovery process. Craft process uses hot caustic soda to separate the fibers contained in the wood chips. Important for efficiency, the process conserves the digesting chemicals through a chemical recovery process. There are two chemical cycles in the craft mill, the sodium cycle and the calcium cycle. The lime kill is in the chemical recovery department and is the key vessel in the calcium cycle. It is not necessarily my intention to give you a chemistry lesson today, but if you look at the process, you can appreciate the importance of the lime kill and that the kill operation is often at the mercy of a much larger process that includes six other steps that sometimes get out of balance or temporarily shut down. This graphic shows the craft pulping process. The sodium loop or cycle is pictured in the center in green and the calcium cycle is in blue over on the left. We will look at both cycle processes and get an understanding of how pulp, the raw material for paper making, is derived from wood. It is essential to note that these two cycles are, that are involved are wet or aqueous chemical processes. Wood chips are cooked for perhaps two hours in pressurized digester vessels at about 350 degrees Fahrenheit. Once the wood chips are separated from the lignin and the cellulose, the brown fiber is washed and sent to a bleaching plant. 
And that is the goal of this part of the paper mill, simply creating the pulp. Some mills exist just to supply pulp to the open market. Other mills use the internally generated pulp to make cardboard, tissue, or other types of finished paper. The sodium cycle has three key liquids, more properly called liquors. Washing the fibrous chips after digestion creates the black liquor. The black liquor is converted into green liquor by dissolving the smelt that comes out of the black liquor recovery boiler. Then in the causticizer, the green liquor is changed into white liquor, which is the cooking liquor in the wood digester. So the solutions in the sodium cycle are black liquor to green liquor to white liquor. Now back to the start. The first step after digesting the wood is to separate the pulp. Washing the pulp creates the weak black liquor. A weak liquor means that the concentration of chemicals is low and the water content is high. The weak black liquor is sent to the evaporator to concentrate the black liquor to perhaps 80% solids. Concentrated black liquor is burned in the black liquor recovery boiler. This vessel makes steam for process heat or generates electricity. The organic chemical lignans are burned in the black liquor boiler and smelt collects in the bottom of the boiler. As the molten smelt flows out of the spouts in the boiler bottom, the flow is hit with a water spray that shatters the smelt as it falls into the dissolving tank. Smelt dissolved in water makes green liquor. Green liquor is composed primarily of two salts, sodium sulfide and sodium carbonate. In the solid form, sodium carbonate is also known as soda ash. This is a photo of a black liquor recovery boiler because there is a possibility of boiler water contacting molten smelt and causing an explosion, black liquor recovery boilers are usually restricted areas during operation in a pulp mill, although modern control technology has greatly reduced the occurrence of explosions. By the way, there are some videos on YouTube showing the operation of the smelt spouts. Might be interesting for you to see them. The next step in chemical recovery is to change the green liquor into white liquor. The green liquor is mixed with milk of lime, also known as calcium hydroxide, in the causticizing tank. This is a cross-section picture of the causticizing tank. There is typically an agitator that slakes the lime and begins the causticizing reaction. The green liquor, which contains the sodium carbonate, is mixed with the milk of lime. And in the reaction, the sodium ions exchange the carbonates with the calcium ions, producing the caustic soda, which is the desired digesting chemical and also solid calcium carbonate. The white liquor that contains sodium sulfide and caustic soda returns to the digester and the calcium carbonate is sent to a filter and then to the lime kiln. The starting point for the calcium loop is the causticizing reaction. In the causticizing process, the calcium carbonate precipitates out of solution as a greenish white mud, which is sent to a filter for washing and removal of the residual soda and then dewatering. The feed to the lime recovery kill is a slurry 
that typically contains 70% to 75% solids. The lime kiln then burns the calcium carbonate into calcium oxide or lime, and then the lime is returned to the slaker, which completes the loop. So all in all, there are at least seven steps in the wood digestion and chemical recovery process, and each step has opportunities for upsets and issues where any equipment downstream has to be throttled up or down to compensate for the variations in the process. Now let's take a more in-depth look at the lime kill, whose refractory is the purpose of our meeting today. Like practically all other rotary kills, the lime recovery kill utilizes different grades of refractories in four different zones to match the conditions inside the rotary kill. Starting at the low end of the kill is the discharge zone, which usually contains a dam. The burning zone is sometimes referred to as the calcining zone, and here the work of calcination is done. The preheating zone is the longest zone of the kill, where the mud feed is gradually raised in temperature to prepare it for calcination. The feed end of the kill contains the drying zone, which normally has a heat exchanger known as the chain system. In the drying zone, chains are attached to the kill shell using metallic hangers. The purpose of the chains is to recover heat from the kill exhaust gases and dry the mud feed. Current thinking is that the chain system design is a science of balance. For example, increasing the chain density, that is the total surface area of the chains divided by the volume of the kill, always reduces the specific fuel consumption of the kill. So the more chain you have, the more heat exchange you get inside the kill. Interesting to note, a kill fired with fuel oil requires nearly 50% more chain in the kill than one fired with natural gas. And there is a point where the cost of installing additional chain exceeds any additional fuel savings. Too little chain in the kill results in a mud not completely dry. The wet mud feed becomes sticky, leading to mud rings, which potentially leads to plugging the kill. Now the cooler portion of a chain system is usually unlined. Historically, the refractory in the hotter portion of the chain system was a high strength castable or gunning mix. The castable is held in place with metallic V anchors and the chain hangers, pictured here in red, are welded to the kill shell prior to installation of the castable. Abrasion and impact from the chains can eventually cause refractory wear. In a retrofit or maintenance repair of a castable line chain system, RMAX G or RMAX G QT should be considered for a longer lasting lining. Some kill operators have recently moved to metallic insulated plate liners in the chain system, replacing the castable or gunning mix refractory. Reported advantages of insulated plate liners include larger kill effective volumes, as the insulation is thinner than castable, longer service life of the plates, a less complicated installation, and finally, no need to dry out the castable after an initial installation or repair. This is a photo of the Jamco Econo liners, which have replaced the refractory castable prior to the attachment of the chains. Note the ceramic fiber between the liner plates 
and the kill shell. Downkill from the drying zone chain system is the preheating zone. The service of the refractory here can be described as medium heat duty. Historically, in the preheating zone, 40% alumina RKBs have been used, although some mills today prefer simply prefer to simplify their brick inventories and they've extended the use of 60% alumina brick into the preheating zone. For better insulation, a dual component lining can be used in the preheating zone, although some companies like International Paper specify an imported single component semi-insulating brick of about 100 to 110 PCF density. For two layer linings, Patriot Super Duty Brick has been the working layer in the preheating zone. Typical lining thickness is six inches or 160 millimeters for the hot face and two and a half inches for the insulating brick backup. Scamole M Extra is a common backup brick selection. The preheating zone is the longest zone in the kill and contains the greatest amount of surface area. But because the operating temperature is low, the value of the insulation in the preheating zone is not great. This table shows that insulating the burning zone is five times as effective than insulating the preheating zone when comparing the reduction in specific fuel consumption of the kill. During retrofits for refractory linings in the preheating zone, tumblers were often used to assist in mixing the kill burden. Fresco has the capability to provide precast tumbler shapes for use in this application. Our molten plant has produced tumbler shapes for several line kill applications. Tumblers can make modest improvements in the specific heat consumption of a kill by perhaps 150,000 BTUs per ton of lime for a 20% length of the rotary kill. The work of calcination takes place in the burning zone. The length of the average burning zone in the lime recovery kill is considered to be about eight times the diameter of the kill. This zone is described as high temperature duty. Alumina brick of 60% to 70% compositions is typical for this zone. For energy cons conservation, a dual layer lining is common, often nine inches of fire brick over 1.5 inch thick insulators. In some lime kills with high thermal loading or Frequent operational interruptions, overheating requires the application of basic magnesia brick for the very high temperatures. A routine insulated brick lining in the burning zone features 9 inches Seneca 60P laid over 1.5 inches thick insulators. This photo shows the construction with the installer ready to begin building the dense brick layer overhead on top of the backup skimoles. For best results, both layers should be fully mortared in with a good bed joint between the layers. Estimates suggest that an insulated burning zone lining can reduce the specific energy consumption of a lime kill on average by 650,000 BTUs per ton of lime. One more comment on kill insulation is this excerpt from a recent book published on the lime kill and chemical recovery cycle in the pulp mill. It should be noted that insulating the lining makes it easier to overheat the lining during upset conditions. Clearly, there are trade-offs between energy savings 
and the service life of the refractory lining, but more on this shortly. There are two refractory features that can be present in the discharge zone of the line kill. Most kills today utilize a discharge end dam to improve energy efficiency. The discharge end dam is composed of concentric rings of brick and cause a deeper pool of lime behind the dam to increase retention time in the burning zone. This construction can increase the production rate of the kill and reduce the energy consumption. Estimates suggest that discharge end dams can reduce the specific energy consumption of the kill by 300,000 BTUs per ton of lime. Modern kills have tube coolers at the very discharge end. Often, there will be a castable lining to line this area as we see in this photo. Coating and clinker balls can cause abrasive and impact damage to the refractory in this area. Quick Turn 60 PC is an excellent material for the lining of the discharge end. This is the Quick Turn 60 PC discharge zone of a lime kill in the New England area. Our last topic is the types of refractory wear seen in the lime recovery kill. There are three dominant modes of wear. Erosion, spalling and crushing, and loss of brick. Now, while erosion may look like mechanical abrasion in the burning zone, it is usually related to overheating. An overheated lining can have this appearance, sometimes termed duck nesting. The scooped out appearance of the bricks is a hallmark feature of an overheated high alumina brick lining. Should overheating occur, the damage done to an insulated lining can be much more severe and more rapid than on a lining that has no insulation. Overheating can result from a number of conditions, burner misalignment or excess fuel during periods of low feed rates are two common causes. We can simulate this reaction in the laboratory using cup corrosion tests. In this case, these sample refractory cups were packed with lime mud and heated to 1500 degrees centigrade or 2732 degrees Fahrenheit. At these really elevated temperatures, the lime fluxes the alumina brick, causing a fluid melt to form that upon cooling looks glassy. In this test, the melt was so aggressive, it actually eroded the industry standard sample and flowed into the bottom of the laboratory test kill. The melt, however, appeared to be retained in the Seneca 60P cup, suggesting that the Seneca 60P had better resistance to the melt. An operational procedure to prevent overheating is to sample the lime product that comes out of the kill. Best practice is to sample every two hours and perform a residual carbonate test on the lime. The acknowledged best practice is to maintain the residual carbonate, that is, the amount of calcium carbonate present in the lime sample between 1.5% and 3%. A residual carbonate in this level is also consistent with a more reactive lime, which will slake better and promote the causticization reaction. If a mill is unable to avoid erosion of the alumina burning zone due to overheating, an option is to use a magnesia brick in the burning zone. This practice is what is done routinely in the pebble lime industry, whose kills are typically fired harder and hotter than those in the paper industry. Our product for this application, 
currently is Resco Mag 85C. It is a general purpose magnesia spinel refractory and is currently sourced from China. Basic magnesia bricks have some inherent disadvantages, including high shell temperatures, difficulty of insulating due to their high reversible thermal expansion rate versus that of the insulating component, and high cost. If the choice is made to use magnesia spinel bricks, it is prudent to keep the length of the basic brick to a minimum to reduce shell heat loss, and I prefer no second insulation. It is not uncommon for the kill bricks to exhibit the second type of wear, spalling and crushing. One cause can be alkali attack. Alkalis, notably soda, are carried into the burning zone in the lime mud, and the alkalis are volatilized in the burning zone. The volatile alkali penetrates the brick through the brick's pore structure. The alkali forms alkali aluminous silicates in the bricks, which have a substantially greater volume than the original virgin bricks. The bricks crack at the joints to relieve the pressure caused by the volume expansion. Refractory brick that crack in this manner, and we can see a 45 degree angle approximately to the joints is a hallmark of expansion problems in a rotary kill. We can reproduce the alkali cracking also in laboratory samples using cup corrosion tests. Here you see that the Seneca 60P appears to have less cracking and therefore better alkali resistance than the industry standard. Cracking and crushing can also be due to mechanical stress from the kill shell. One characteristic of the kill shell that can be related to refractory crushing and spalling is excessive dynamic shell ovality, which is defined as the deviation from a true circle as the kill rotates. Most commonly, excessive ovality is located in the vicinity of a support tire, usually within one diameter either side of the center of the tire. Ovality can cause some movement of the lining, as you see here, and this is the early stages of spiraling. As the ovality condition persists, the brickwork can be thrust and displaced causing cracking and spalling. Ovality is caused by excessive tire shell clearance, meaning that the metal filler bars between the kill shell and the tire have become worn. Replacement of the filler bars and shimming the tire back to specification are necessary repairs for this condition. Misalignment of the kill shell can also lead to excessive ovality. In this case, a kill alignment must be performed and the support rollers may need to be repositioned to return the kill to good alignment. Brick loss usually requires immediate action to shut the kill down to prevent damage to the kill shell. Brick loss can arise from a loose installation as occurred here. This suggests that the installer did not achieve good brick to brick and brick to shell contact during installation. Brick, lock, brick loss can also be caused by deterioration of the backup layer or by simply operating on too thin a lining, as is seen here. 
During the annual outages, the thickness of the brick lining should be determined by inspection and or drilling into the lining. A record of measured brick thickness at consistent intervals along the kill length is an important tool for planning refractory replacement during annual outages. Finally, high kill shell ovality can also thrust bricks out of a ring and cause brick loss. I hope that this presentation was useful to you. The lime kill is a necessary and integral part of the craft paper mill. The lime kill is used to recover caustic for the digester. The lime recovery kill refractory practice is fairly straightforward. Resco manufactures excellent refractories for the lime kill, especially our burning zone brick Seneca 60P. There are trade-offs when it comes to kill insulation. As a general rule, a decision to insulate the kill refractory should be based on fuel costs, knowing that kill insulation may negatively impact refractory life. Record keeping of refractory replacement in the kill is an essential part of a good maintenance program that includes planning for future refractory repairs. Finally, I want to acknowledge an excellent resource for pulp mill operators. The book Lime Kills and Recosticizing, The Forgotten Part of the Craft Mill, was published last year and edited by Peter Hart, Glenn Hansen, and Richard Manning, experts on the lime recovery kill. Incidentally, I was a co-author for Chapter 9, Refractory. Some of the details in this presentation were excerpted from this book. The book is available from TAPI. Thank you for listening today.